Today, it is our privilege to have in our midst Dr. Dennis Litke, a revolutionary in the field of education. Dr. Litke holds a double PhD in psychology and education from the University of Michigan. Dr. Litke has also co-authored The Big Picture, Education is Everyone's Business. Every single industry in the country is experiencing a talent gap. The unfortunate part though is that when I speak to HR managers and I ask them why there is this dearth of talent, they often complain about how bad the MBA colleges are or how the engineering colleges are not living up to the challenge. And very conveniently, schools like ours uh, escape the whole criticism, right? Because people don't make that connect. But children are actually spending 14 years with us. And while the buzzword right now in schools is 21st century, we're talking about children being able to work in teams, about assertive communication, about having the intellectual openness to embrace the better ideas of others. How are they going to build that intellectual openness that we keep talking about? In fact, forget about all of this. Do we even let them exercise thinking inside classrooms? Dennis Litke has been able to put together a model of education that bridges the gap between the classroom and real life. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the most, perhaps the most daring educator in the world and definitely the most passionate educator that I know of. Now in the old days things were different. When things just started, there was a certain amount of knowledge and they were trying to say, okay, you've got to all learn that knowledge. Now, it's completely changed. You can find anything I talk about. You can find it in a second. Just Google it up, and you can find that knowledge. So what's really important is how do you apply that knowledge? Everything, the new brain research says, the way you learn is not by listening, is not by seeing, but it's about doing. I had a teacher in one of my first schools, and she was known as the best United States history teacher, okay? And her kids worked hard, and they all got A's, too. And she showed me the exam. They did incredibly well on these exams. When they came back in the fall, two months later in September, no one passed the exam two months later. <laughs> so what does that say? It's not that the knowledge isn't right. It's not connected to the student at all. Now, I go back to the question, what is learning? This is a very famous psychologist. He said, the way to become a great learner is to learn anything, but to learn it deeply. How do you go deep in learning something? That's what life's about. So somebody did a research study in the state of Illinois. They found 10 years later all the valedictorians. That means they got all A's in high school. That means they got all A's in English. They were top of their class. And they asked him, when was the last time you read a book for pleasure? Most of those people hadn't read a book for pleasure in three years. Why teach English if you're not getting a kid to want to read? Big deal that they could answer your questions. It's nice they can answer your questions, but if the day they got out of school they stopped reading, you didn't do your job. And then I said, I really believe in schools. So let me go to a school, and I got the chance. I was 27 years old to start a school. And then all of a sudden, the parents saw their kids loved coming to school, and their parents were doing well in school. And you know what happened? It was a middle-class school district, and kids had some skills coming up to me. This was a middle school. We scored number one in the state of New York in reading and number two in math by not paying any attention to the test. We got the kids to love read. If they love to read, they're reading every night. How do you get better at reading? You read. Mathematics, they didn't hate it. They didn't, the exam came and they didn't say, oh, I don't know this, I don't know this. It was all applied, so they said, oh, let me try this. I know how to do this. We created the Met School which is a school that I said is hands and mind. Most time you learn your job when you're in something real. 
That's why we use internships. Not that we're not a vocational school. I don't care if a kid's working at a bakery, becomes a baker or a doctor or an architect, but he's working in a real world, have to answer real questions, work with real people, have real deadlines. And we think we can teach without knowing a kid. Not true. Relevance. We got to connect it to who the kid is. One of my friends at another school, all of a sudden, you know, she's teaching all 100% um, African American kids and they're studying the French American War. She says, I just can't do it. It's not their war, they're not connected to it. If you want to teach war, start about the war in your house. Start about the war in the city. So you have to figure out a relevance. And then we ain't playing around. It's got to be rigorous and deep. Then I start with, I say, what's your interest? Most ninth graders got no clue. No one's ever asked them, what's my interest? They go, I don't know, money, sports, rock and roll, you know? And then we keep asking and we have different mechanisms and forms they fill out and little tests they take. And then they say, you know, my aunt was a nurse and I love that. So then we have them call. They don't know how to talk on the phone to people besides their friends, by the way. Um, so we have them actually call people, talk about, can I come visit you for a day? We call it job shadowing. Then if they like that, they have an internship, two days a week, every single kid in our school. So in, in my school in Providence, I have 900 kids. They're all, everyone has an internship. Now, it's not just two days a week they go out in their internship. When they come back, they work on projects around their internship. So it's all connected. And we put the science and the math and the English. Every kid has their own learning plan. Mom's sitting here, dad's sitting here, kids here, advisors here, saying, what do we need? What do we need to work on? So parents are fully involved. That's so important. Who is the first teacher? The parent. So many times in school, we try to keep the parents out. But they know the kid. Put them at that table. So my first year, I had this little girl, Marin, who was a terror in eighth grade. Uh, the, her eighth grade school said, I'm not even sure you should take her. She gets in a fight every day. She's never done any of her work. So she comes to me and says, I want to study death. So I get a little nervous, you know, like I said, you could do anything but death. You know, so I quickly went in the back room and called her mom and dad, say, can Marin study death? And they said, okay. So sure, you can study death. She, her internship was a funeral home. She was visiting cemeteries. Came time for her exhibition. Her parents are there, other people are there. This was before, this is 20 years ago now, before the computer, she showed she had 27 drafts of a paper she did. And she starts talking about death. And I said to her, Marin, are you gonna keep working on this? You did this for the first 10 weeks. And she said to me, no. She said, my sisters and brothers were all killed coming over from Cambodia. Death was in my mind 98% of the time. I couldn't do anything else. I have cleared my mind. I am ready to move on. Do you know how proud I felt as a principal that I, thank you, that I wouldn't just have to send her to an algebra class or a history class. I could allow her to free herself up and really study something that was bothering her and staying in her brain. The attendance in the United States in your tough cities, half the kids come to school each day. We had 98% of our kids come into school. Every single kid got accepted to college with a big scholarship. And then I got very lucky. Uh, my, uh, in the year 2000, my first graduating class, Bill Gates heard about us, sent his top man down to see us. Then he went in, let me talk to kids came out an hour and a half later and said, here's $5 million, give me 10 of these schools. And then over the next 10 years, another $20 million to put this school around the country. So as you heard, we have over 50 schools in the United States. Then these uh, women from Australia and the Netherlands kept following Elliot and I around till we said, you can do a big picture over there. So we have like 40 schools in Australia, uh, close to 20 in the Netherlands. Um, we're starting in... Uh, Korea, and we're starting a whole group in um, Europe. So I'm hoping my job is to bring this idea here 
and that hopefully people can pick it up. We don't try to run it in a country. We try to get somebody excited in that country to take this design.